You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Going to my mum's for the weekend. I've come back. Someone's like me fucking telly, ain't they? So I'm absolutely livid. And then I've got onto them because I've got CCTV. Anyway, and then I've seen who it was. And then I've seen him in the like lobby and I just nutted him. I see a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of bad stuff. Like um, I've seen like screws getting like locked in places, screws getting battered. I've seen things that have happened to girls, it's like blood baths. Really, really bad, bad, battered, bad stuff. And I remember it was about five o'clock in the morning and I had a big pint glass of red wine and a cowboy hat on. And I was like 18 and I'd, um, something happened with my Ray-Bans or whatever anyway and I set fire to his door. But it was like I completely blacked out. You come across like you're violent, you're angry and this and that, but really you're in pain. Yeah. Really you're scared, really you're, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just a defense mechanism to try and survive. He's grabbed me, pushing me up against the wall. I'm there thinking, don't know what the fuck he's going to do. Looking around for things to grab. There's a kitchen knife on the side. I've slipped over, grabbed it, poked him. Found this woman that um, molested, like, she was a nursery worker. She molested, like, babies when she was at work. And I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to absolutely batter her and go to the block. At least I get out of here. At least that's one down. So on the night, it says in the papers that he was on the ground and you've stabbed him twice in the face. Like, yeah. What's your side to that story? So on the day of sentencing, um, I've gone there and the judge said, um, I'm, I thought she was talking to someone else. I was looking behind me. She went, I'm putting this in a category one, 15 to 19 years. And I was like, Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Nia too. How are you, Nia? What's happening, James? You're all right. I'm good, good to thank see you. you. You too. Just out of prison? Yeah, recently, yeah. 14 stretch? 12. 12? Yeah, mental. Yeah. Yeah, but <laughs> before we get into all the madness, I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up, how it all began. How it all began? Uh, I grew up, basically growing up, it was like um, a bit of madness, obviously, as you can, like a lot of us have been through, like, Drugs, violence, prison. It's kind of what I grew up around. Uh, and then... Um, How were you at school? Um, I got like extreme, I got extreme like ADHD. Um, but I wasn't diagnosed till I was like 28. So I didn't really do well at school. I was like, I didn't really have much kind of say, let's say guidance or kind of whatever. So I was just out there just trying to survive really. as a young girl on the streets. What about family, parents? My dad was kind of like on drugs, in and out of jail, stuff like that. My mum done her best. Um, but yeah, you know what I mean? Brothers or sisters? Yeah, I've got three older brothers, yeah. They're my soldiers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How was it? Uh, did you feel like, not like abandoned, but father figure not there? It's, it's kind of always the same kind of connection with people who slip yeah. from violence, prisons, abuse. Like addictions, like there's always, it's not a family unit. Yeah, yeah. Did you find that took its toll as gradually you got older? Uh, definitely, yeah. Yeah. What about when you left school? Did you go to school much or did you just leave I didn't at really a young age? do school much, but I went to um, college, stuff like that. It was always like, I always, I've always been like focused, always like, I'm going to have a career, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. I've always been very driven in that sense, but because I've had a, a lot of like trauma, mental health issues, abuse, all that kind of stuff as well. Together, it was kind of like a, a battle. Do you know what I mean? Because it's like, I'm trying to win, but then I'm trying to survive. So then at the same time, it was just like, yeah, it was a struggle. But yeah, I was always training to be um, a hairdresser. So I was working and, uh, but I was still like right kind of troubled, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Were you causing trouble at a young age? I was in and out of trouble, yeah, on the, on the roads, doing all sorts of shit, getting nicked, fighting, like, what else? Robbing shops, just silly stuff when you're young, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just just out there, just trying to survive in this world. Yeah, it's difficult, especially growing up in a hostile environment, father yeah. figure lost, like, if you grow up and drink drugs and violence, it becomes an on. Exactly, like, and also it's like, you, you pick up behaviours, don't you? It's learned behaviours, and then it's not until you get older 
you realise that then you've got to kind of assassinate all them traits that you've then picked up through life and realise how they've not really got you anywhere. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What about relationships? Um, uh, they've not really gone too well. Like my first relationship, I was like 15. It's for a couple of years, but that was like really bad domestic violence. Um, I stuck with it for a while because it was all I knew. I'm, that's all I knew was violence and stuff like that so to me it was kind of normal um until it got like really out of hand and then yeah just messed up mm -hmm. my whole kind of perception of relationships i suppose well, like i say we're not here to fucking target a press or, or like you've done bad in life you've you've served your times and stuff as well you're out now you're trying to make a cleaner living but when was the first time you went to prison first time i went to prison i was 18 what for what did I go to prison for when I was 18? So basically I lived in this um, like block thing. Uh, with like There was loads of us, you know, like um, 18 to like 21. And um, I had this, I remember I'd just moved in and I had this like little plasma, plasma TV and uh, no one really had fuck all there. And I brought a few people around and we're having a little party. Anyway, I've gone to my mum's for the weekend. I've come back, someone's nicked me fucking telly, ain't they? So I'm absolutely livid. And then I've got onto them because they've got CCTV. Anyway, and then I've seen who it was. And then I've seen him in the like lobby and I just nutted him. <laughs> and what happened after that? I just went to jail for eight months. Got my telly back though. <laughs> <laughs> was that a young offenders you went to? I went to basically, I was, it was the day before my 18th. So I went to juvie, young offenders for one night. And then the next day on my eight, my birthday, I went to the main prison. I was buzzing because I could get some tobacco. Do you know what I mean? How was that for you, 18? Like? <laughs> Fucking scary, man. I remember when I first got there. So basically I was on A wing, which is like induction. And then from, from induction, you move over to C wing. And that's when there's like three, 400 people on there, massive. And then I remember I've moved, from, you order your canteen on A wing. So I've ordered my canteen, then moved to C-Wing, but A-Wing gets it before C-Wing, if you know what I mean. Mm. So people kind of clocked that um, I was going to get mine before them and kind of all followed me over. And I remember being with this little traveller girl on the way in and I was like, right, listen, fucking five of them behind us. They're following us for this canteen. I'm shitting myself. I was, I was shaking. I said, we are not, get I said, this is paving our way right now for how things are going to go. We're not getting robbed for this canteen. I don't care how scared you are. Anyway, we've gone in there. She's like, I'm not going back. I'm not walking back. Told all the screws. Got my canteen. I've grabbed hers, put them in a bag. And I just said, fuck this. This is going to make me or break me here. I'm either going to be a victim for the rest of my sentence or I've got to just have it with any kind I see. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I've got the canteen, I've walked out and there's like two over there, two over there, one over there, give me it, give me it. I was like, no, fuck that, I'm not giving it. The next day they've all come up to me and they're like, oh, I respect you for that, we were just testing you. I thought, fucking hell. Did but it paved my way, they said sorry. Did you take, see a lot of violence at a young age in prison? Yeah, I see a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of bad stuff. Like, um, I've seen like screws getting like locked in places, screws getting battered seen things that have happened to girls it's like blood baths really really bad bad battered bad stuff it's naughty in there any suicide a lot of it yeah sad the whole you'd know because you just feel it in the air and like you wouldn't get out of the cell in the morning you'd know when the doors went unlocked you feel it in there you know someone's gone again mm -hmm. so as a girl 18 in prison like in the adult prison like did you it's, it's hard when you're young because you don't see fuck all wrong. Mm. Like you think everything's kind of just normal, but yeah. did you ever have anything in your mind thinking, what the fuck am I doing? Or was it just kind of, because that, when I was in prison at 22, like, it ended up cool. Yeah. I felt it was a fire stripes. Yeah. Even though it was a few months, even though I was scared going, yeah. I felt it was a thought, oh, that's cool. I can blag about it at the, at yeah. the pub and be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but for a young girl, 18, like, did you feel that as if it, you'd done some stripes or do you think I need to change my life? I was thinking, I need to change my life. I was thinking, this is like, this is not cool. Do you know what I mean? I've got to sort my shit out. Then obviously I've got out and that was my plan. Then I went back to college and I was working, but I was still so kind of troubled, you know? So it's like as much as I, I had that drive and I didn't want to be a part of that life, I kind of didn't know how to kind of get out of it if you know what I mean I didn't know how to kind of um it was all I knew drugs violence prison that's all I'd ever seen my whole life so then trying to change trying to say no I'm not doing that but then 
everyone around you is criminals. Like, everyone around you is... You know what I mean? It's like, it's tough, man. It's tough. Does anybody offer help in prison at a young age? That no. therapy, nothing like that? No, it wasn't until um, I'd got out and then I went back and then I went to court and the judge went, this girl doesn't need prison. This girl needs help. Like he said, she, you can see that the, some of the things she does, she's not, it's not like as much as it can look a certain way. He said, you can tell by her behaviours that it's not kind of like malicious. It's, she's just troubled. Do you know what I mean? And then um, obviously in the system resources and stuff like that, no one really cares. There's so many people that are lost in the system. Everyone's got a sob story, ain't they? Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So you just slip slip through the net. Luckily enough, the, the last time I went away, obviously, when I got the um when I got the 12, I met this great woman. I never trusted anyone in my life. But I met this, I met this woman and she started telling me things ab about myself and about life and made me look at everything from a completely different angle. And I just and I just then I started like reading, doing therapy, reading loads of books, and just like dissecting my whole fucking character, everything I'd ever seen, everything I'd ever been through, picking up every where did I get that behaviour? How? Do, why do I think like that? Pulling it myself all apart to kind of rebuild myself to how I was I was meant to be. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What did you do after your eight month? What did I do when I got started going in college? Then I went on a mad one. I had a row with my next door neighbour and uh, I was only about 18 so he lived next to me in this block and I remember it was about five o'clock in the morning and I had a big pint glass of red wine and a cowboy hat on and I was like 18 and I'd, um, something happened with my Ray-Bans whatever anyway and I set fire to his door but it was like I completely blacked out and then I've like this I don't know, I've set the fire to it and then it's like I blacked out and then the minute I've seen the flames, it's like I fucking woke up and then I ran in, I started getting saucepans, throwing the water all over it, called the fire brigade. That's when the judge was like, this ain't fucking normal behaviour. Do you know what I mean? She's not trying to hurt anyone. It's all camera up. She's obviously just, there's something wrong with her. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah, and then obviously I was speaking to this woman, she's a powerful, powerful lady, very intelligent. And um, she told me about how I've got serious complex PTSD. I've got extreme ADHD. She said together, they're like a combination. It's like recipe for disaster. So then I went on um, medication for the ADHD and it's changed my life. See, like, when you get angry, is it just see red and black out or are you still in a, a frame of mind where you know what you're doing? Not, but you just no, can't no, control I'm, it? I, I used to be. I used to be. I don't know whether it's because of just how I was, how I'd been raised and what I'd taught myself and the ADHD or I don't know, but now I'm so chill. Like I didn't have kind of control over my emotions. I didn't understand them. And because I always, and, and obviously anger is a secondary emotion. There's always a feeling that you feel before you get to anger. But then a lot of people just res result to going straight to anger because it's what they're comfortable with. But really, they're not really angry. They could be sad, frustrated shame it could be any of them but then people just go to that because it's just that cycle that they know protection yeah and it's fear even though it's the yeah. fear kicks in the abandonment or the anxiety yeah. or, or the, but it just like you say it becomes a protection even mm. though for like, abusive relationships people are angry people hating work people stuck in traffic yeah it's just it's like a little protection because yeah. something bubbling inside yeah. them that they can't control and you look like you come across like you're violent you're angry and this and that but really you're in pain yeah. Really, you're scared. Really, you're. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just a defense mechanism to try and survive. Yeah, like you say, the, the violence you've caused and the shit that you've done. Like, it's not because you're a bad person. It's yeah. because you're shit scared. Yeah. By life. Yeah. Same as every gangster interview. That like, people say that you get scared. I don't get scared because I see vulnerability. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. people who are angry and it's such a cliche, but they, it's like a, everybody says it. But the loudest man in the room is the weakest. Yeah. And it's it's, it's, tr it. it's true, do you know mm. what I mean? But it's not that people are bad. Like people do bad shit and they're still good people. But yeah. it's just, you get caught up in such a life where it's try to understand people's lives. And mm. Things like these podcasts as well. Try to understand your life, why you ended up in prison, what yeah. you've done, what you've done. But then what the fuck can you do for the future? Mm. So when you set the neighbours down fire, mm. what happened there? And then I got, um, it was mental. So basically, obviously the police had come, fire brigade had come. Got arrested, got, went to Holloway, and then I'm in Holloway for a couple of months, and then I've gone to court, and the judge just looks at it, and he said, what? He said, this ain't, this ain't right. She doesn't need to be, go, she doesn't need prison. She, she like, she kind of needs some help here. 
And then uh, and then what happened? So then basically he then let me out and he put me on bow and I was on a tag. And I was like, um, I went sleeping. I was like, I was in a real bad way over it. So I remember being like so scared of outside, so scared of people, so scared of myself after that had happened, the fear, couldn't believe what I'd done, how it could have ended up, all of that panic, panic. So then I went to the um, police station with my tag box about 10 o'clock at night, I had to be in at seven. Went there about 10 o'clock at night and I was like, listen, I've breached my tag. I'm not supposed to be out, basically begging them. I need to be banged up. Couldn't cope, I, I didn't feel safe anywhere. And then I went to a police station, they said, no, a warrant's not come through yet, it has to come through from the tag people, whatever. Spent 10 days, police station to police station, all around East London. Essex. Finally, on the tenth day, I've got back. I've got back to Essex. I went, yes, near to. He warrants come through. Said yes. Got in that cell, and I swear to God, I've never felt so safe or so at peace in my whole life. Like it was crazy. I needed to just be there and like think, calm, where I felt safe and think, what the fuck is going on with my life? Do you know what I mean? How did, how did I ended up here? Kind of thing. Was that when you felt your, your safest when you were in prison? As yeah. If you couldn't hurt anybody else. Yeah. Especially yourself. Yeah. What, were you ever suicidal or anything? Uh, no, because I know I've got too much to live for. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No. Any drugs involved? Uh, like, not really. Like, I'd have parties and that here and there. Um, but I've never been like on drugs like that but yeah recreationally have a little party get on the MD smoke a bit of weed whatever stuff like that in jail but nah not really so after you set the stone fire what happens then where do you go with your life there then I uh, what happens then then I got nicked again at a house party um basically there's a house party Big, there's a geezer there, he's basically kicking everyone out or whatever. Anyway, long story short, he's grabbed me, pushed me up against the wall. I'm there thinking, don't know what the fuck he's going to do. Looking around for things to grab, there's a kitchen up on the side. I've slipped over, grabbed it, poked him. It was only half a centimetre cut, like I only poked him. But anyway, yeah, and I've poked him with the thing. He's got off me. I've ran out like, what the fuck? Got banged up for that. And the maddest thing was about that was I was screaming like... I had to, I had to. He had me up. For, I don't know what, what, could, what could have happened if I'd never done it because I was so afraid because of situations that I'd been in. And anyway, I was screaming the whole time. I was, I was on remand for about a year for it. Anyway, I was on remand for about a year, done all that. Told them what happened. They said, um, basically, no, you're guilty. I've done two and a half years. And then after about a year, I was in a, I was in a pad with one girl and we were talking about it, what happened that night. And uh, I was like, yeah, I fucking had to. I said, he had, me, he had me up. I was looking around for things to grab. That was the only thing there I had to. She went, but why didn't you just kick him in the balls or something, Nia? And I went, you know, it was like, it was so mad. It was like something just clicked when she said that. And I thought, why didn't I? You know, there is other things that I could have done. It didn't need to go like that. But because when, you, when I was in a situation like that, because of our situations that I've been in in life and not been able to get out of them, I'm thinking, you, I don't think rationally. It's like it's me or them, you know, like very, what's the word? Um, is it hyper, hyper vigilant? Don't know. No, I don't know. But yeah, anyway, and then when she said that, I was like, oh my God, why didn't I? I could have saved myself years. I didn't, but you just, just not thinking right. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, just fear, just panic. But yeah, anyway, and then I'd done that and then got out. Well, what would you do, two and a half year? Done two and a half year, what yeah. What prison were you in? I was in uh, Holloway the whole time, actually. What was that like? Oh, shit, oh, yeah, it was, it was rough. It was like you'd sleep on the top bunk and there'd be like condensation because of how cold it was and the windows were broken all coming down, dripping on you when you was asleep. They put me on the uh, lifer wing at one point. Why? Because there was, they were shutting the prison down. So when they were shutting the prison down, they were starting from the bottom, working their way up, you know, like clearing it out. And uh, so then they're moving people higher up, getting rid of people and then moving everyone higher up, higher up. Obviously the lifer wing's right at the top. And they never ended up putting me right at the top. And I mean, like, f full of no marks. Do you know what I mean? Like, a lot of them are absolute wrong -uns. And then um, they've put me up there and I'm there for a couple of weeks and I'm thinking, fucking hell. When I first got there, I thought, I can't do this. 
I can't be around these. I can't be around these kind of people, like child molesters, baby killers, stuff like that. And I'm there, fucking livid that I'm there in the first place after the kids tried to batter me. But I know that I've done stuff wrong. I know that I did it him. I know that I ain't perfect. So I know half of me should should be there. Do you know what I mean? But then uh, I'm up there in the laugh ring and I'm thinking, I've got to get out of here. I don't know how, I don't know what I've got to do, but I've got to get out of it. Anyway, so then I've, there's this, found this woman that um, molested, like, she was a nursery worker. She molested, like, babies when she was at work. And I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to absolutely batter her and go to the block. At least I get out of here. And at least that's one down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't condone violence, but I'll condone that. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> no regrets. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it like battering her? Someone who was abusing kids at nine month old? It was good. She earned it. And yeah. they're so protected and stuff. And it's disgusting. Um, but yeah. And I, I don't care. I went to court for that. And I said, yeah, I've done it. And I've done it because she's a child molester. And that's it. Basically, what more are you gonna say? Yeah, and who was that woman? Marie Marie Raisin. Oh. Her name's Marie Raisin. She's like um, sending pictures and stuff online to people, and uh, just uh, working in a nursery. Absolute wrong and scum, bad. But yeah, she was in a bad. She was in bad shape. <laughs> how many of them were in prison? But how many molest child molesters and that were in? Loads looking? of them. The thing is, with women's prison, like men's prison, they separate them, don't they? Women's prison, they're everywhere. Like, everywhere. You've got to be very careful. So you've done your two and a half then, like, again, back in prison, longer sentence. Mm. Like, it's difficult once you're in that bubble. It like, is to it's get just, out. you fucking just then start believing that that's normal life. And it's sad because there's so yeah. many people like it. Yeah. They think there's no way out. They think that's what they deserve. They think that's all they can get in life. But, I've had so many people on this podcast that have changed their life. People mm. who's done 30 years in prison, 40 years in prison, and came out and made changes. Of mm. course, it's hard. Life is tough. Yeah, it without is. Without being in the jail, without yeah. being fucking abused <laughs> as a kid, without having addiction problems, that life is fucking a, it's yeah. a good old slog. Mm. But when you get out after your two and a half, what, what are you then thinking? I'm thinking, this is it for me now. I'm getting my head down. I'm staying away from people that are not good for me, places that are not good for me. I'm focusing on my career, and I'm, I'm just going to win. And that was it. And that's what I was doing, working really, really hard for that. And then uh, I've gone out that night and that's happened. But then unfortunately, because of my past. They threw the book at you. They threw the book at me, yeah. When I actually was for the first time in my life, hmm. like, it weren't my fault. It's understandable as well because of history of violence. Of course. Like, if somebody, no matter what you say, looking at that on paper, you're thinking, lock her up for life yeah setting doors on fire you could have killed people stabbing people in the ass yeah fighting yeah battering fucking pedophiles is good you should get a reduced sentence for that <laughs> if I'm honest yeah but, yeah 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 you can understand it so the night that changed your life for, well your life's already in kind of turmoil no disrespect but it's kind of you're not like a lost soul you're trying to find a way you can't find a way you seem to get sucked back into that mm. life because of the old emotions but when you're just out of prison, you're trying to change, you're working hard, you're trying to do things right. Mm. What happened the night you get your 12 years? So then basically, I remember I was at home and I remember I was with my brother as well in the kitchen. Do you remember when my phone rang and my mate Jade, she rang me and she was like, oh, um, Nia, she's found out about her boyfriend cheating on her, something on Facebook or whatever, can we go out? But she was my good, good friend when I was young. But from when I was about 18, 19, I stopped going out of her because she's a nightmare when she has a drink. So I said, Jade, you know I don't go out with her. She says, please, Nia, you're all I've got. And then when she said that, oh, I was like, oh, fuck's sake, go out, I'll meet you in half an hour. Gone down there, so I've said, oh, I've got no money. Because I'm thinking, she's a single mum, she won't have much money. I'll say, I've got no money. Then hopefully we can't drink a lot. She won't get pissed and we'll get out of here. And then uh, we've got there. We're in the bar having a couple of drinks. It's Paddy's day. Then So I've ordered a Coke. The next thing, I've seen her pull out a big bottle from her handbag. And I thought, this is it. I thought, we're fucked tonight. Because I'm with her and she's an absolute nightmare. Like, next thing, you know, anyway, we're in the bar. We're having a great time, getting loads of shots. Look, getting loads of video, just having a great dance here and having a great time. Gone down to the toilet, come back up, the bouncers are separating everyone. Obviously, something's kicked off while I've been downstairs. Come up, don't really know what's going on. They've separated everyone and they've kicked all the boys out. So I'm still there with my mate in the bar. So I'm on the phone. My mate says, I'll be there in 10 minutes to pick you up. So I've had a couple of drinks with me and I said, 
oh, fuck this, right, I'll drink that and I'll bring this one with me. You're not allowed glasses outside. Anyway, we've gone out, my mate said he'd be there, so I took my drink out and we're waiting outside. Next thing, they've these guys have come back from around the corner. As they've come back from around the corner, they're trying to scream and shout at my little pal, but she's fucking four foot and her wristlet, mate. Honestly, she's about that, that big. So they're trying to scream and shout at my pal. I've stood in front of her, I said, listen, calm down, mate. Everyone's been kicked out now, like, leave it. All I'm thinking in my head is, Neo, you're not going to jail, don't go to jail. Because that's what you think, that's what your mentality becomes like. Absolute panic, fear all the time, like, to, because of how easy it is to lose your freedom. Do you know what I mean? And how easy it is, quick it is to get caught up in shit that just changes your life. Do you know what I mean? It's not worth it. All I'm thinking, yeah, don't go to jail. You can't go to jail. Can't go to jail. The geezer's back. The geezer's hit me. He's hit me again. He's hit me again. Knocked him out with a glass. Next thing, I'm there, covered in claret. I'm like, fucking hell, what am I going to do? So I thought, I was looking at him, I thought, well, he's bad me, so shall I stay? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because I'm all right, because he's battered me. But he, obviously, he's, he, I won. But, but then I thought, I've got to go. So I just ran. <laughs> just ran for my life, cut all my hair off. <laughs> Went on the run. But what caught, this is how mad it is. Obviously, they didn't really know who I was. But what the maddest thing is, is what they got me on, is that, a couple, a couple of days after it happened, I looked him up to find him on Instagram. I found him and I messaged him and asked him if he was all right. And then obviously from that, my profile back then used to be in my like government name and it was all open profile, is then seeing the pictures of me in the outfit that I was wearing that night on my Instagram, called the police, gave him my name. And uh, yeah, that's how I got arrested for it because I messaged him and asked him if he was all right. I'm asking him if he was all right. Like... After he's battered me, because I've got heart. Do you know what I mean? So you stuck yourself in, basically? Yeah. <laughs> so the I did, but I didn't think, because I knew that he'd started on me, mm -hmm. I wasn't really worried about it. Self-defence, you're presuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wasn't really worried about it, to be honest, until it all got... I realised that the whole bill was everywhere and it's all a bit wild. I, that's when I thought, shit. How long I'm were you on the run for? Uh, about three months. I was getting different names, travel lodge to travel lodge to travel lodge, hotels everywhere, all in different names, four days there, three days there, three days there. How did you get caught? So one night, um, I used to book hotels, so I'd book four nights there. Then before that four nights would run out, I'd do three nights there, three nights there, whatever. But you can imagine living like that, how draining it is. You know, just exhausted. Like I'm washing my clothes in laundrettes. I'm meeting people at two in the morning with face masks on, just panicked. And then... Uh, one night I never got, um, I never booked the hotels um, going forward for the next night. So anyway, I thought, fuck it, I'll just get a little B&B &B or something tonight and then sort out the next few days the next day. I'm there and I'm looking, looking, looking to about one in the morning, couldn't find a hotel anywhere. So I thought, do you know what, fuck this, this is what I do. I'll go to my mum, set an alarm for five o'clock in the morning and then sleep there for a bit, then just get out at five. Obviously I've not been in my bed for three months, I've not chilled for three months. Got to my mum's, got in the bed, fell asleep, fell asleep through the alarm. Next thing, police are coming through the door. Remember, my mum's answered the door, but obviously they're coming around all the time and I'm not there. My mum's answered the door and she's like, obviously I've slipped in, but I've slipped in about two in the morning and I've not been there for months. And I'm, I, I could hear my mum downstairs going, she's not here, you come here yesterday, you know she's not here, come in and have a look. I'm upstairs, I'm like, you're joking me, about come in and have a look. So I remember running and I tried to get in this little wardrobe and I said... <laughs> I said to one of my brothers, shut the door, shut the door. Anyway, he's shut the wrong door. And I'm in there in this little cupboard, trying, like, <gasps> trying to stop myself from breathing, trying to keep this door shut. And anyway, they opened me and the door, I fell out the door and that was it. What are you thinking then? Do you think, did you think you were going to get a big sentence? Or no way. This is cool anyway. No way. I knew that obviously something was happening because obviously I did hit him with a glass. Ultimately, that's, you know, like, you can't do stuff like that by the law. That's what the law says, whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, I wasn't too worried, no. And even when I'd got to the police station and I didn't go no comment or anything like that, I gave the interview, told them what happened. The CID, the woman, she went from she went from woman to woman. Nia, I feel sorry for you. She went, but the eyes of the law, this is GBH with intent and you need to tell your family that you're going away for a long time. My heart dropped. I thought, what? How does that even make sense? Do you know what I mean? I couldn't, com I couldn't comprehend it. I never said to anyone I'm going away for years because I didn't believe it, you know, like, I didn't believe it. I thought, there's no way. How can I? Why? You know? And they stitched me up so bad, so bad. 
And I know that it's because of my previous and and stuff like that. They they then put it all together and then create this character of you on paper where you look horrendous. And then no matter what kind of what you say or or what's obviously the truth, which is things that factual things that are clear and stuff like that. It doesn't matter because they've even if they believe they know it's the truth or not. I was sitting there in court and I was sitting there thinking, looking at the prosecution and stuff like that, and I was thinking, you know that I never done that. You actually know. So how are you gonna how are you doing this to me? You're gonna ruin my life, but you know there's facts there to prove that I never done that when he was on the floor. I couldn't understand how people could actually do that. Um and then the next thing, uh yeah, they've put they put it all together, create this kind of perception of you that you can't really you can try and justify in ways, but ultimately you do have to take full responsibility and it doesn't really look great. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So on the night it says in the papers that he was on the ground and you've stabbed him twice in the face. Like yeah. what's your side to that story? So basically I've hit him with the glass. We've watched the CCTV two and a half hours of that whole night of everyone that left that bar. You're not allowed to leave that bar with glasses. So we watched the whole CCTV. No one left that bar with a glass apart from me, one glass. So I'm there. He's hitting me. We're standing up. I've hit him with the glass. As I've hit him with the glass, he's, he's got a three centimetre slice down his face, which is clear. That was from my right um, my right arm to the left side of his face. One glass left that bar that night. So that's hit him in the face and that's disintegrated into my hand and into his face. So that glass is then gone. So then he's then on the floor. There is no glass left for me to be able to then hit him further on the floor. I'm on the phone as he's come over to me. As I've left the bar, my mate said I'll be 10 minutes. So I'm on the phone and I've got my glass. They've come over. I've got the phone in my hand and the glass. He started. Anyway, the phone's dropped on the floor. I've hit, he's hitting me. I've hit him with the glass. The phone's dropped on the floor. He's dropped on the floor. I'm there then in a panic. I'm looking around for my phone. I find a bit over there and a bit over there where the phone's broke. I'm then fuming my fucking phone through the phone. Yeah, through the phone at him. They've said, that I've then went and armoured myself with another glass and then glassed him further when he was on the floor. So then I've then said, okay, cool. So I don't know how that can be proven when only one glass left that bar that night and that disintegrated when he was standing up in my hand and got the, the slice down the side of his face. So then if I've then glassed him again when he's on the floor, you're going to have, he's flat on the floor. And if I glass him again, it's not going to be slices, that's going to be wounds. They're going to be, do you know what I mean? They're going to be deep. All the medical records proved that there was nothing like that. There was no wounds. There was just that there proven for when I was standing up. So factually, I could prove that that was impossible for that to happen because there was no glass and he never. there was no medical evidence to support what they was trying to say. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I got fucked for it anyway. So how did they roll with that then if evidence was to state exactly. that it wasn't a stab, like stab wounds? yeah. Because they said that's how it looked. Even though I could prove that, that that never happened, they fucked me over. I stood in that box. I swear to God, I stood in that box and I made them play the CCTV in my solicitor. And I stood in the box to so the judge and the jury and I made them stop at every single punch. punch when he punched me, stop. I went, did it, it was like I was running the show. I went, did everybody see that? Everybody saw that? Cool, play. Again, bang, stop. Did everybody see that? I've done it four times on the four punches to everyone. And then I went, right, now I fit in with a glass. I said, if that was your daughter, that was your sister in that situation, what would you expect them to do? Do you know what they said? They said, if by not, you was conscious when you had that glass in your hand. So by not dropping that glass, the only thing you could have intended to do was cause him GBH with intent. They said, I said, what would I have done if I never hit him with that glass? They said, you would have been the one that ended up on the floor and he would have been the one that ended up in prison. And I said, how can you kind of, I weren't willing to take that risk. Yeah, but it's about taking the risk, isn't it? Like, yeah. For somebody who's been in abusive relationships and had beatings, like it's, it's, it's to make that call, but for looking for the law, Yeah. Like they're just going to throw the book at you no yeah. matter what. Like, what about witnesses? <sighs> So my mate, um, the one that started it all, she never come. Why? I don't know, because she knew she started it and she was scared. Okay, she went to prison? Yeah. 
And they were begging me for a name, begging me, begging me. I'm not going to do that. I want you to come. You should come for me. You started it. You're not in any trouble. Come and help me out here. Just, I was begging her, just come. And all you need to do is just tell the truth. She, was, she wouldn't come. And I never obviously said anything. So that made it look even worse because it was like, if that's your best friend, why is she not here? And why are you not telling us who we are? But you have these, you have these ways, don't you? And these morals that you grow up with. And I would never do that. I would never, t even if it fucked me right over, I would never give, I'd never give her a name. Do you know what I mean? And what about the guy who was glass? Do you know him? I don't know him, no. But his girlfriend was a witness. She, I needed her. Um, obviously, she didn't realise, but everything that she said in her statement that night was everything that had happened. It was the truth. She was right next to him, watched the whole thing. So I needed her to get in this box and, and say, her what she'd seen because it was exactly what had happened what I had said and it was the truth and it was proven that I was not guilty for doing it when he was on the floor the girl got in the box there was she was silent she was choking they was like what can you read your statement please can you read your statement please and then she dropped the thing she went I'm she went I'm uh I'm Nia knows a lot of people she went I'm scared she went I'm scared for my life I'm not willing to give evidence so then they threw that out um, and said, right, we can't take anything she says as credible because she's not willing to say it in front of the court. So basically dismissed her whole statement. So then I had no one, had nothing. How long did the trial run for? Uh, 10 days. What were you thinking halfway through the trial? Did you think you were fucked or were yeah. you thinking you still had that chance? I was thinking I was absolutely fucked. When that had happened with the witnesses, I thought I'm absolutely fucked. And my solicitor said to me, because of your previous and because of what's happened with the witnesses and stuff like that, he said, you, I could, if you want, you could go guilty now and I could probably get you seven to eight years. And I said, but guilty for what? He said, for glassing him when he was on the floor. I said, I'm not willing to do that. I said, I'll go guilty to what happened. Glassing him when he was standing up, I'll take five years or whatever, I don't care. But I'm not going to go guilty to something I didn't do. He said, all right, but I'm ad advising you that you know, it's not kind of looking great. He went, but you're not guilty. You're not guilty near the whole, from what you've told me, you're not guilty. This is self-defense. And I remember looking at him and I was scared for my life, man. And he went, trust me, you're not guilty. Trust me. And then got all the way, obviously got to the end and uh, I got guilty. And then basically I'd got guilty, but the, um, so it was always in a category two. So it was like five to nine. Got found guilty for it. Um, and it was in the category five to nine. But then on the day of sentencing, I got sentenced on Friday the fucking 13th. So on the day of sentencing, um, I've gone there and the judge said, um, I'm, I thought she was talking to someone else. I was looking behind me. She went, I'm putting this in a category one, 15 to 19 years. And I was like, what? She went, because the injuries wasn't serious, I'm going to give you 12, take her down. I went, What? Are you joking? I said, people fucking kill people and get less than that. You've got paedophiles in there doing six months. People are killing people and get five years. Are you he bad me? You winding me up? Yeah. And that was the strength of it. So then I appealed. I um, got rejected for, for my first appeal. Then they tell you basically, um, you know, if you appeal again, you could get, your first appeal was fine. If you lose it, if you appeal again, you could get extra time. So that's a risk to take. Obviously, I didn't give a shit because I knew I didn't do it. I said, I'll appeal again. You have to pay private and stuff like that. Anyway, got a new solicitor. But this is when I really knew I was absolutely fucked. So we'd got a new uh, private solicitor and uh, finally had got the listing for an appeal in, in the um, appeal court in Strand. And... Uh, and then on the day that it had been listed, I'm ringing up, ringing up to find out what happened. And the um, barrister never turned up. And then we was calling the company, obviously trying to find out what had happened because they can't, they could not process my appeal just on papers. They needed to have a representative there. And obviously he wasn't there. And then we've contacted his company, tried to find him and stuff like that. And he disappeared. He disappeared with the money. What? What? How much? No, serious. About only about six hundred quid. But I needed him there, mm -hmm. obviously, to fight my appeal. That's why we'd we'd paid him. And I took two t took me two and a half years to get to a bill call. Mm -hmm. The guy disappeared. That's when I sat there and I, my head was like, "What?" That's when I sat there. I was in style with <laughs> Manchester. I sat there and I thought, "Nia, mate, there's a reason you need to be here for all these years. Don't know what it is, but one day you're going to figure it out because this is like." Don't make no sense. Mm -hmm. It's kind of stuff you can't make this shit up. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's mad, but because if you do bad shit in life as well, we do get away with a lot. Yeah. And then there's something always catches up with, mm. not that you deserved it, mm. but 
even the guy, the, the door you sent fire, the guy's arse that you stabbed, the guy you glass that. Is part of you not glad as well that you never killed anybody? 100%. 100% and I sat there and I thought do you know what at least even though I know that I didn't do that I'm paying my fucking dues for everything that I have ever done and you know and then I'll come out with a clean slate and know that I've got to use them years to ensure that I never ever come back here to ensure that I, I make myself into the best well-rounded person I could have been in, could have even made better than I could have been in society and just make sure I use that time to just like be better, do better, forgive myself, forgive people and, you know, just change my life. So first thing in the cells after getting a 12, what are you thinking? But like I say, basically a life sentence. I know people have done worse as fucking get lesser sentences. Uh -huh. And like you say, the nonces and fucking paedophiles are getting three months and six months. Yeah. That's because part of them are all fucking judges and lawyers anyway. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah. So... When you're in yourself then, in yourself, what, 12, first night, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, I was just, I just, in shock. I just, I don't even know what I was thinking. My head was blown, completely shot to bits. I couldn't believe it. But I thought, because I knew that I didn't do it, it was like, I thought, I'm going to get out of here. Like, I'm going to, I thought, this can't be right. Everything, and I remember speaking to my mum and I was like, yeah, but everything comes out in the wash. You know, like, I will get out of it, we'll get out of it. And she said to me, she says, Neo, you got to understand that you may have to do all this, the, all these years, you know. She said, not everything does come out in the wash, Neo. You may have to do it. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought, what? You can imagine I'm only 23. And I'm there and I'm thinking, 30? I'm going to be 30. That feels like right old at that time. Do you know what I mean? And I thought, what? I thought I was going to have a mortgage and a family and all this and that, all this that I'd planned for the, for then. Do you know what I mean? And just visioning myself having to spend all them years growing up in there, it was painful, painful. What's your mum saying when you get a 12 and that? Like, were you in a good relationship or close at that time? It was a bit up and down, really. We always kind of clashed when I was younger. Um, quite similar, fiery personalities. Um, and obviously we've calmed down a lot, you know, as we've got older. Um, but no one could believe it. No one could believe it. That's why I said to him, um, I was in Bronzefield at the time and I was having visits and stuff all the time. And, you know, people were just coming and just looking at me and I could just see the pity, like, in their face, just feeling sorry for me. And it was just eating me up. So I said to him, get me, I need to go as far away as I can go from everyone and everything I know to try and get my head around this. I've got to get out of here. And uh, I got him to send me up north to Manchester. It's like a completely different world. Don't know no one, don't know nothing. I've not got anyone looking at me like putting... I remember when I first got the sentence the next day, I'm coming out myself and people that I've known for years are putting their head down, not even looking at me because right. they, they don't know what to say because they feel sorry for me and, oh, I couldn't cope with it. I couldn't cope with it. You know? it. What was the biggest sentence in there? Mm? What was the biggest sentence in there? It must have been fucking close to 12. Mm. But what was... Other girls, what was the biggest sentence in there? I don't know, not like that. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Nothing like that. What? Really bad. I knew get, there was girls in there that like stabbed people up on a like malicious one, killed him six years, baby killers five years. I was fuming for a good three years, really, really fuming. Were you causing shit in there the first three years? Yeah, absolute chaos. Prison to prison, protests, selling stuff, mobile phones, everything, just on one. What sort of protests were you doing? I was just doing like, doing like peaceful protests, I used to call them. I'd just like stand on tables, <laughs> refuse to go myself, sit there all night, get on the MDMA. <laughs> and, just, <laughs> and just absolutely fucking terrorise them. What about friends in prison? Mm, a lot of them are no marks. <laughs> no, but I, I did make a few friends. Obviously, they're... I found some real good friends, rare breeds, do you know what I mean? But not a lot, do you know what I mean? What do you tend to see with a lot of girls in prison? They're just, um, it's just drugs. Everyone's on drugs, really. Everyone's like out to get you. You've always got to watch your back. Everyone's shady. Do you know what I mean? No one's your mate. You know, it's dangerous. It's not, it's not, it's dangerous, yeah. It's not comfortable, do you know what I mean? At all. Did anybody ever try and test you in there? Uh couple of times, yeah, a couple of times, yeah. But obviously I've been away before, um, so I know a lot of people. So I'm like, I'm not a victim. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, yeah. What's survival mode in there on a daily basis? What do you need to do? Just be on your toes 
or ways. Is there any stabbings or anything with the ghettos? Or just yeah, cat yeah, yeah. I've seen people get sliced up, stuff like it's that, razor that. blades. Razor blades on toothbrushes and that girl's, yeah, crazy. But it's mad. I had the, uh, the Black Widow on Linda Calvey. Mm. She done it over a 20 stretch, man. Really? She says she murdered her husband and she never. Fucking hell. She fucking never. But, and she was so staunch, man, that she never broke. She could have got out yeah. like, after seven, eight years if she admitted it. Yeah, she exactly. Never, she yeah. never admitted that's, that. Yeah, that's what was happening to me. They probation. So basically after four years, you could get like... Uh, home releases and stuff like that but the only way for me to ba be able to have got that was to accept full responsibility then show an extreme amount of remorse and then kind of beg for the home release i could do it my mum said to me nia please you got to you have to you're not going to get out you have to i say i can't i can't i'll do the bird there's no way i can do it I thought if i'm going to do that now i could have done that years ago and got a seven and said that i'd done it I'm not going to do it now. I'll do my sentence. They can have every fucking day of it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Never going to, never. Was that kid in court? Yeah. What was vibes like with you two? Oh, awkward. I had his family over there. We was all half arguing. Like with my friends that were there, they're in the gallery. Oh God, it weren't good. Mm -hmm. So that obviously didn't look good as well in front of the jury. We was all young as well. Do you know what I mean? And it was... It weren't a good look at all. And the judge that I had, she don't, my solicitor said to me that she'd only recently turned in, turned into from prosecution to a judge. He said, so basically she's trying to earn stripes as a, like, as a fresh judge. And he basically said, you're fucked because if that's what she's doing, he said that people know that that's what her plan was. So that's why out of all the courts in Snaresbrook Court, the press was in my court. Why are they in my court? Why are they in my courtroom? Out of all the courtrooms there, because they knew they was going to get a story from that, because they knew she was going to fuck me over. And they did. 12 years, girl gets 12 years everywhere, everywhere. If that was a geezer, yeah, and a geezer that had a fight on St. Patrick's down, and I asked, is he getting 12 years? They got three out of four. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Is it going to be all in the paper for it? No, it probably happened in every bar, every bar all over London on Baddie's Day. You'd have probably got a shorter sentence if you killed the cunt. 100%. My solicitor said to me at the end of it, if you'd have killed him, I could have got you 10 years for manslaughter. He said that to me. Yeah. I was like, what? What sort of people much? were you in with when you were doing your 12 stretch? Some mad people. Oh, gosh, some crazy, some crazy things. So, you know that... Uh, Obviously, Joanne Dennehy. Mm -hmm. So I'd done a, a thing, a, a video about her before on my um, TikToks. People was asking for it, but they took it down or whatever. So I was in with her because um, she killed them three geezers, but she kept the dog. And I always wondered when I saw her in the papers and stuff like that. So she's got life without parole. I think it's just her, Rose West. I think there's so, someone else. I think there's about three people. Anyway, so I always wondered and always wanted to ask her, why she killed the geese but kept the dog and she but she lived in the block for the first four years of her sentence like because of how high profile she was but she used to go to the gym here and there like proper bang in the gym like an absolute machine but she'd always be escorted anyway one time I'm in the gym and she's come in the changing room and I thought you know it's awkward but I thought this is my time you know I really want to fucking know why she kept the dog <laughs> do you know what I mean and then she's in there she's at the, she's at the sink sniffing MDMA she's like do you want some I thought this bear's fucking mad so then I thought fuck it she seems kind of cool let me just crack on and ask them what's, what went on I said so what happened how come she killed them geezers but you kept the dog she said oh the dog looked hungry oh well what you killed the, the dog looked hungry. She was like, yeah, I felt sorry from the dog looked hungry. And I thought, oh, mate, you're absolutely fucking wild. Like some of the girls in there, there was this other bird that I met and she went, um, she had green eyes. She was a dark skinned girl, but she had bright green eyes. And I was like, oh, your eyes are lovely. They're so nice. And people was like, they're not her fucking eyes. Of course they're not near. They're contact lenses. Why are you so gullible? And then I went to her, oh, what are you in for? She went, oh, I got um, like a, I think it was like a, do you go call for a speeding ticket? Yeah. It was like a driving offence, a yeah. minor driving offence. Basically, so she got a driving offence and she said, uh, she went, oh, um, I got a driving offence, but I couldn't be, uh, um, she went, she, she couldn't be asked to go. So she called him up and told him she was dead. <laughs> what? <laughs> she called him up and told him she'd died. <laughs> They'd found out she didn't die, obviously, so she was in jail for perjury. And people are like, Nia, she lied about her own death. And you're believing her that there were contact lenses. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? I said, why'd you do that? She said, oh, I was hungover. 
So, mate, you're doing three years for perjury, you can. What's the worst thing you've ever seen in prison? Uh, what's the worst thing I've ever seen? I've seen some mad stuff with the screws, you know, like things they've done to people. Like what? Like um, loads of them, 10, 15 of them, massive, running up on little girls and just battering them, dragging them out, beating the life out of them. Bad stuff like that, bad stuff. I've seen this other fight uh, one time I was in up, up in Drake Hall and it's very relaxed prison. You're allowed like China Cups, things like that. And there's a big fight went on there. There's like all different houses. They're all named like from different places. Like you've got Richmond, Margate, um, Folkestone. They're all named different things. And there used to be kind of like little wars between the different blocks. And then uh, one time there's a big fight went on and... Uh, this girl I know got smashed up with the the cup, China cup, really bad, knocked out, blind in one eye and everything now. Bad, bad way. Was that many meal screws? Uh, yeah. Have affairs with the girls? Loads. Loads of it, yeah. I've had a couple of guys go shop for me and that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Go shop for me, bring me back a pack of tobacco, bottles of rum. This one, she's gone now, so I can talk about it because she got found out. But this one bird, when I was in Bronzefield, she was young. She always used to kind of come and chill with us. She was cool. She used to bring us in, you know, like the blues, blueberry, like um, Rizzlers and stuff like that. And then she went away for a couple of weeks. She went on holiday to Spain and she was unlocking in the morning. She unlocked eight o'clock in the morning. She unlocked, bust the door, gave me a big bottle of Uzo. And I remember I had to be at work in the gym in fucking half an hour. And I'm there, obviously, I'm cracking onto it. So I'm drinking the Uzo, having a big party. And I remember the staff turning up half hour later from the gym. They're like, Nia, what are you doing? You're supposed to be at the gym. What's that smell? I'm like, oh, it's mouthwash, it's mouthwash, right? mouthwash everywhere. Pissed out my head. And anyway, she got sacked. But that was so funny. But yeah, I've had a lot of screws go shop, bring me back tobacco, loads of affairs going on. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. It's not like you, you have this perception of kind of prison, but it's until you're there in these women's prisons, it's not really, it's like people cracking on with the screws, parties all the time. It's like, it's, it's wild. <laughs> what sort of parties? <laughs> Big parties, like um, loads of drink. Bottles, obviously, if you're getting from the screws or hooch, like MDMA, everyone gets on pills, smokes a load of weed, lock the door and just have a big party. Did you make your own hooch? Yeah, yeah, I'm professional. Yeah, what did you use? Potato skins? Bread? <laughs> no, I used bread, mm -hmm. apples, but I used to boil the apples, spend hours boiling them, cooking them up, fermenting them, sugar, maybe a bit of Marmite. Yeah, and then I'd be like, woo! Oh no! I can't make touch for we. You to keep it behind the toilet, but I don't think I've ever been right since I fucking drank it. <laughs> I'm fucking serious, man. I think I went blind at one point. I don't know if it was yeah. poison the bastard put in it. Yeah. I seriously don't. I've, I've never felt fucking right since. I never touched that again. I don't blame you. No, it's dangerous stuff. Fucking mad you do bastard. have to be careful. Yeah, because he wasn't right in the fucking head. <laughs> None of them are, were yeah, they? That was the first and that was the last. <laughs> I was fucked, man. I thought I was going blind. Did you? Yeah, I was fucking tripping balls, man. It's probably laced it with something, the cunt. <laughs> so when you're in then, when, you, like, when was the time, did you ever have a, a moment? And It's difficult, especially if you've been diagnosed with a few things to then come to a conclusion or a, a mm. mindset where you want to make decisions. But was there a time in your sentence where you thought, that's in normal. Yeah. When? That was about two and a half years in, when it was just, well, I was just wild and trying to get my head around it, prison to prison to prison, drugs, phones, fights, protests, all of that. And then when that had happened with the appeal and that guy had disappeared, it was just like you couldn't make it up. So then something really hit me then and I was just like, wow, you're halfway through, you've been fighting, fighting for this, you've already done half of it now this is still your life ultimately and you've got three years left and you've got to, <laughs> got to make sure that this time's not, I don't spend the whole six years being getting out angry and bitter and, you know, because people you get worse. If you don't take control of things and have a plan and get your shit together, you, you're fucked. Some people go there and they don't come back out the same way. Do you know what I mean? Majority of people. Pardon? The majority of people yeah. don't come out the same. Like, yeah. It fucks you up, man. Like, yeah. That's such a high percentage of people just go back. Yeah. Like, when you're doing your sentence, then, like, did you have to do courses before you get out? Had to do courses, yeah. Get I was begging and really trying to get on as many as I could, to be honest. What was it like to eventually speak to people and kind of open up about the past and stuff? Uh, uncomfortable. Really uncomfortable, but very eye-opening. You know, getting other people's 
perceptions on things that have had completely different lives to you and all you know is what you know and that's your or that's what you believe to be normal but then ha having other people that you actually have got trust and respect for telling you things of how that isn't normal you sh do you know what I mean it isn't normal to think like that it isn't normal to have seen stuff like that it isn't normal to believe stuff like that smashed my head to bits it was like wow but until you when you're kind of stuck in cycles and that's all you've kind of got around you, you don't know no better. You don't know no different. Do you know what I mean? But it, it like it changed my whole, changed everything. Changed everything. Do you feel as if it helped with your temperament as time went on and you were getting help? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Because I, I had to accept that, you know, I could be I could be angry, I could lash out and this, that and the other, but what's it for? It's for other people to feel my pain, ultimately. It's because I'm in pain. So that's what I need to heal. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Doing being angry and stuff like that, it's not helping, it's not saving me. It's what, not What was it like getting out after doing a seven? Really mad. Scary. For the first when it got closer for the for about three weeks before I got out, I was like I didn't talk to anyone, I didn't ring, I didn't, I, I was like different, I was weird, like I was just so quiet and just trying to prepare myself for the reality of I'm getting out of here, it's what you've thought about for so long, it's all you've ever wanted, it's what you've dragged yourself through all this for and then it's got there and it's like, fuck, how am I gonna, I'm not used to the world, do you know what I mean? I'm used to just being in this cell on my own, you know, and it was like, over really overwhelming everywhere I went I felt like an imposter I felt like I shouldn't be here I just felt a f anxious really really bad anxiety it's given me some days now I don't I could go for a couple of days and I'm like don't talk to people or I'm just like because I'm s it's so overwhelming still do you know what I mean mm -hmm. how are you going to deal with that then moving forward for the future just to just stay focused on my goals and remember what what it's all been for you know it's not all been for nothing. I've got to get what I deserve out of life. I've got to make it. And if all the stuff that I've been through, I'm not a quitter. I've never quit. I've always fought it and I've always got through and I've always come back better and stronger. So I just make sure that I, I keep that mindset and just and just know that like, I was born to win, you know? <laughs> How long are you in license for? Uh, I've got six years. Yeah, I think I've got five, five and a half left. Yeah, I know it's heavy. Are you scared that you'll go back in? Uh, yeah, it's a real bad fear, to be honest. I think it's subconsciously there all the time. <laughs> but do you think that could maybe keep you on the straight and narrow, knowing that even one wrong turn, yeah. you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison? Yeah. It's so difficult to... Mm. But I, wait, how old are you? 30, 31. 31, so still fucking young, man. Mm. But, but it's scary to think that the next time you could get done for I'll anything and you're, yeah. you're in until you're fucking 40. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Because like, some people just break. I know. And end up just accepting that life, mm. accepting prison, mm. accepting the misery of it. Yeah. And like you say, there's not as if it's loads of bad people in prison. Like they've done bad shit. Yeah. They're just lost souls, man. Exactly, They're man. They're broken. Like there's some evil bastards yeah, out there. Of course there is, yeah. To be there. Like, yeah. You've been speaking to the day, like you've still got a good nature. Like people might watch and go, ah, but you shouldn't have done this and that. Yeah. Listen, you fucking make mistakes. Yeah, we'll learn yeah, from them and yeah. grow from them. But, and you know what it is as well? It's like, I feel like people just see things and they see things as black and white. But at the end of the day, life ain't fucking black and white. There's a lot of grey areas and no one don't look at that. And I feel like people just get penalised for this, that and the other and just throw a sentence and then throw a sentence and then, but no one's trying to get to the root of this shit. No one's trying to see why, why has this happened? How can we stop reoffending? How can we break these cycles? But no one don't care. Prison is a profitable business, more heads on beds. No one don't care about changing the cycle. Do you know what I mean? And it's ultimately, it's not, it's your responsibility to do that for yourself. But then if you've, all you've got and all you know is certain ways that have not helped you, then how are we going to, you know, How's mm. things gonna change? I just, I just feel like, you know, it's not a lot of um, people need to just look at things from different angles. I can try and, I don't know, just try and help people, try and help people more. Do you know what I mean? So, how does then, how do you then stay out of prison? Like you've been in prison in and out for the last fifteen years. Mm. You've battled with many things. You've done a lot of things wrong, no doubt. You've done a lot of things right. But how do you then focus to stay out? Like, do you become a liability to yourself or have you learned a lot 
I've to then a not make the same mistakes. Hundred mm, percent. You have to be very disciplined, very hard on yourself. You have to make. I have to make choices that I may not want to, but I know that I have to. You know, like normal things that I would have just gone along with, or or whatever, because it was natural to me because of what I've grow, grow, grown up around. You can't do it. You've got to be kind of solitary in a way and just stay focused. Think about look at my family, you know, watch my mum getting old, think about all the years that I've lost, you know, and just think about stuff like that. Think about all them times when I was stuck in that fucking cell with nothing on my own for years. And just even if it's painful, I have to keep reminding myself of them memories, keep putting myself there mentally to give myself that drive to make sure that I never, ever, ever go back or be around anything or make any kind of, have any kind of mentality or anything anyone around me that could, you know, jeopardise me my fu- having a great future. You, Do you know? have to go and see a parole officer every week. Mm. You got to sign in. Mm. How many times a week? It was twice a week, but I'm one every two weeks now. What about you can't go on holiday or anything? Can't do nothing, no. Nah. Still shite, but you've still got your freedom. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you can still learn and grow and yeah. Like you don't know who watches these sort of things and like for people being on there, like I'm versatile. I'll have anybody on to tell their story that no matter what the past is, no matter what they've done, like, it's just for people to, you tell your story, people can make assumptions, like people, I genuinely think you're a decent person, like, oh, do you know what I mean? Like, obviously you. you've made fucking mistakes, but who hasn't? Yeah. Like, you're just trying to get your shit together now. And That's it. What about for the kid who got the bottle smashed in off his face? What if he was watching this? What would you say? He killed himself two years ago. You're joking. Mm. Oh, that's sad, isn't it? Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Shit. He's obviously battling his own shit as yeah, well. Yeah, so I then mean? I'm and then I'm sitting there in jail thinking I'm doing this sentence as well. And now he's not for someone that's not even about. And I'm just thinking, this is just life's just fucking crazy, you mm-hmm. know? Everyone's everyone's going through something, and they it's just about how you just can't let it def- can't let it define you or beat you. Yeah. Obviously that family's going through a lot as well. It's not as if we're here to glorify the stories, you're here to yeah. just tell your story. Yeah. Like you've made your mistake, you're not sitting here glorifying it. Mm. You'd like you say you take responsibility. Mm. You obviously you feel hard done by and rightly so if yeah, everything yeah. you're saying is legit, do you know mm. what I mean? But mm. it's just ain't it mad how life works. Even you found out that boy was dead, obviously. Like what are you then thinking? Does party ever think like you don't want to obviously think, oh, I'm here because of him because you'd still done it. You'd like yeah. you say you still lifted that glass and still done it. But was a part of you ever think that it could have been because of what he went through? No. No? No. I don't think so. No. So where do you go for the future then? Now I'm just like I'm obviously I was a hairdresser before. Mm-hmm. So I've just like been refreshing on that. Um I'm working in a salon, I'm doing lashes now. I'm just trying to just build and work at thinking about branding and stuff like that at the minute to be my own boss and just to, I've got a great, um, my client base is like blowing up as well. So I'm just, yeah, I'm looking to just build an empire and just win. Yeah, good yeah. on you, man. It was your brother Leo messaged me and sent me a few articles, read a few, I've done this girl's off her fucking nut, but <laughs> she's perfect for this show then, do you know what I mean? But obviously speaking to you, you can tell you where your heart and your sleeve as well, like you can tell. If you're somebody's friend, you're going to fucking die for them. Yeah, basically. for real. But you've obviously moved through under a, the bus a lot of times. Yeah. But again, you like you say, you've got to take responsibility because it's still your actions. We all have choices at the end of the day. Yeah. Even though if it's only the choices you know, mm. it's about time sometimes you put your hands up and say, you know what, I'm going to make better choices. Yeah. Work on it. How do I work on it? Get help. Speak to people and hopefully people can point you in the right direction to make changes. Like, do you still going to go and speak to people about your past and your trauma and your pain? I'm not sure because to be honest, like when I started the... Um, the TikTok, um, and I put a couple of things out there and then people wanted to know like more things and stuff like that. I felt like mentally it took me to a place back there and then it made me, I feel like it started to make me feel a bit depressed. But then I thought, you know, this is my story at the end of the day and I've got a lot of experience that could help people and I'm very passionate about injustice. I've seen so much stuff go on that's not fair you know the whole IPP thing that's been abolished and so many people still left in the system on that the whole I'm trying to raise awareness of um the Jengba campaign the joint enterprise for murder that's they're trying to that's going up in parliament now so many people left in doing life sentences for that I really do want to I am really passionate about trying to raise awareness of all this kind of stuff just to make some noise really for the kind of for the people that can't because I've been there you know Mm -hmm. so think maybe yeah you still in contact with people from the jail not allowed 
Had you not by no. association? People, people I know, people's come out in home leaves. Had a photo with somebody who was active, bang, bang, back in. Finished their sentence. Yeah. Association. Yeah. Is that association or is it just? You're just I'm not, not allowed, allowed any contact with any serving prisoner. What about people's on home reliefs? Uh, oh, I'm not sure. No, like people's just so. been in prison. If they're out, yeah. Not if they're in. Which is a shame because I've got a couple of friends, you know, that I've done a lot, a lot of time with that you've become so close to, you know, and it's, it's fucking not worth it's it. It's fucking though, sad. It? It's not worth it. Yeah. This is what my brother was saying. My brother said it's, I'm like, so many times my brother said, Nia, you can't do it. It's not worth it. This you, is your yeah. life now. You would have to finish your sentence. Yeah. Like, For what? No fucking about that. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? Do you feel as if you're constantly on eggshells then? Yeah, I do. I do. I feel it, it's mad because I, Part of me feels like I'm constantly on eggshells, but then the other part of me just feels like it's 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 split because I feel a bit like that, and the other part of me just feels so confident and so like strong because mm. I know that I'm not going back. I know what I'm on. I know who I am now, and I'm confident and determined on where I'm going. Do you know what, what I mean? What sort of medication you're on now? I'm on um, medication for it's like um oh what is it? It's for my ADHD, so it's like. Menthol phenidate, it's like I've got like speed in it that like kind of calms you down. They said I've got like, she was like, you're the most extreme case of ADHD I've ever seen. And she said, I've never really trusted medication and stuff like that. I never wanted to take it. But she said, trust me, you need this medication would change your life. And uh, yeah, so I take that now. It helps me concentrate better. Mm -hmm. Keeps me more less kind of up, down, scatty. And I uh, can concentrate on things more, get tasks done and stay focused and growing forward now as I'm an adult it's very important for me to do that I'm not young and thingy like wild anymore do you know what I mean it's all about going forward staying focused getting your shit together and winning what is your TikTok and stuff social media platforms in case anybody wants to get in contact yeah so it's Nia921 uh, is my TikTok mm -hmm. and my Instagram is Nia N-I-A N-I-I-A inspired and um, yeah I'm just that's my thing and I'm <laughs> yeah and obviously I'm build, trying to build up my brand uh, for my hairdressing and my lashes and stuff like that I'm going to be posting stuff like that on TikTok unfortunately obviously I've started the TikTok and then it's blown up from the stories but then um sadly my dad passed and then that had happened kind of at the same time so I haven't really been posting much stuff since then because it's been yeah sorry to hear that thanks yeah, yeah it's crazy got to kick on babe and just fucking keep your head above water man yeah. try and do the right things like people going to prison you've, you've clearly spent enough time in fucking prison to know what it's about like yeah you screw it up and change your life then you go around prisons you help young offenders you go around that's children's it. homes that's like, what I want to do you, you make give some a little bit of fucking inspiration you can just change yeah, their whole don't make the same mistakes that I've done let's yeah. give you all that pain and misery to try and yeah. make better changes like 100% I really want to try and be able to do that for people but you can you if know? you keep the nut do you know what I mean mm. like Nia would you like to finish up on anything my love mm. uh, I don't know <laughs> Nah, you promoted everything in that anyway. Yeah. Like I say, coming today, just fresh out of prison, like, just try to change your life and yeah. get your own story across and and try and learn from your mistakes. Like yeah. I say, none of us are perfect, man. That's but it, and you can't, but you can't let it define you. You got, we've all got choices, exactly. haven't we? Listen yeah. for coming on today and telling your Thanks. story. Thanks. Hopefully, you stay out of trouble. I wish you all the best for the future. God bless you. Thank you. Take care. Nice one, James.